Oh my god. This is for real. No joke anymore. Gotta button up my buttons. Hey folks, let's spend some time with friends up north. Pat Kreitlow of Up North News is on Lake Lesota. Kristen Bry of Asgos, Wisconsin is along Lake Michigan. And up on Lake Minocqua is Kirk Bankstead of the Minocqua Brewing Company. Wherever you are, welcome, because you're up north. Well, welcome. Good to have you up north. Whether you are uh, treating this as a conversation over coffee at the cabin or having that first old fashion of the weekend, we are glad that you joined us here on the lakes. Lakes, plural. We will explain that in a minute. Coming up on today's show, there is a hint of light at the end of the tunnel marking one year of being under a pandemic. And finally, the vaccine is flowing like lineys at the lodge. Also, we find out what's really in the American <laughs> Rescue Plan for Wisconsin and how Ron Johnson tried a delay tactic that blew up in his face so badly, Warner Brothers is asking him to play the coyote in the next batch of Roadrunner cartoons. We discuss a radical idea about daylight savings time. Well, it's radical if you use a sundial to track the day. We talk about a botched first wolf hunt, a big success for Bernie Beer, and we answer the burning question, who is the most badass woman in Wisconsin history? Uh, it's not Kristen Bry yet, but she's working her way there, and she will normally come to us from alongside Lake Michigan. Uh, Kurt Bankstead could normally be found on Lake Minocqua. I'm Pat Kreitlow, normally found on Lake Wasoda. And guys, it's spring, and there the ice on Lake Wasoda is starting to head out. Kirk, what can you tell us about up on Minocqua? Oh, man, it is a rainy day today, and I was get, grabbing groceries, and I could barely get in. It's just ice. It's just ice all over my driveway. So it's not the most beautiful day up in the North Woods today, I have to say. But any kind of rain is, is going to make that ice start to go away a bit more and a bit more. And I'll tell you, from a Wasota standpoint, there's only one, one fish house, one shanty left on the ice. And I, I, I'd like to imagine that there's some poor guy. He's at home going, <laughs> What am I forgetting? I know. <laughs> do. Kristen, you're you're out and about already, probably playing sand volleyball. Totally. Uh, I was. There's still a little ice on Lake Michigan, but you know it's never fully fully covered. But I'm hoping that we don't. This is this is the light at the end of the tunnel as far as not having another snowfall. But I think I'm smart enough to know that that's not going to happen and that we probably still have another cold wave. But you know we can we can cross our fingers. This is the first spring. This is there's another winter coming. Like, there, yeah. have you seen like the nine seasons of Wisconsin? Like, this is just this is the first spring, and there's a second winter, and then there's a second spring. Speaking of seasons, Kirk, the last time anybody saw you was election season. Yeah, you were, you were a name on the ballot, and uh, much like my time on a ballot, after your name is no longer on the ballot, you you know kind of go to ground for a little while. But now you're back, like your groundhog that you are. <laughs> what you been doing? What's what's happening with the with the brewing company? What's happening with the restaurant? What's your story? Well, I was, you know, I was pretty pretty exhausted. So I kind of went I and I didn't know what was gonna happen with the brewery. I'd shut it down for the, you know, because of COVID. Um I had to lay off all my employees and I, you know, I kind of I have to admit, I went to Costa Rica and I went surfing because I was kind of lost. You know, I'd lost this election. I was just overjoyed that Biden won. Uh, but I, you know, felt really bad about having to close my brewery. So I just went surfing and then kind of like collected my thoughts. And I don't, I mean, I don't know. I just was like, well, we, we started selling this Biden beer. And then I was just like, let's just keep doing this. Let's just sell progressive beer. And so I came up with this idea, uh, had my brewer make, you know, a Biden beer and inauguration day beer. And then we made a Kamala beer and all everything. So, you know, I've, I've been making beer now. And I've rented my the brew pub out to another outfit. So right now we're just going to be a brewery, and we're going to keep on trying to sell uh, what I call progressive beer. But don't say just a brewery. You are in Wisconsin. That 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 is a, a fine <laughs> core business, and obviously we we wish well uh, the folks that took the restaurant. But I think we're still going to be able to see you around Manaqua once in a while. You you got. I'm not I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I'm I'm here in my uh, my house right now with and I can see Lake Manaqua from my window and. I'm, I'm, I love it. So the fact that I'm, we I'm can sticking around. Pull you back though from Costa Rica, you know, where, where you <laughs> escape. Everybody does a little something to escape. I'm, I'm guilty of that too. Kristen, on the other hand, 
moved to Wisconsin from California. Kristen, we normally only see you in like 15 second TikTok videos. So you get now 16 seconds to explain why you left California. I left California because contrary to popular belief, I think there's a lot more opportunity for me to do stuff here. Uh, you know, in, in those, I've been living in big cities since 2003 and was kind of convinced that that's where you had to be to be an ambitious career, young professional. Um, but getting stuck in Wisconsin last year was probably one of the best things that happened to me because it opened up all the possibilities of getting to do comedy and getting to do educational comedy for a market that doesn't really get served with that kind of stuff, especially that kind of specificity. And so making jokes about, you know, Wisconsin state legislature, I don't know anyone in New York or California that really thinks that that's their market, but I've, I have found a niche. And so I've decided to double down and, and honestly, I'm just, it's, it's pretty great here. I think, especially I'm loving Milwaukee um, and loving just a little bit uh, easier quality of life rather than the hustle of LA or Brooklyn or San Francisco. Well, what you really tapped into is that there, there is still, for as much as people like to trash politics and most of the time it earns it, folks in Wisconsin are still engaged. They still actually want to know, you know, what their politicians are doing. So you've been able to tap into that through, you know, short videos that, that poke fun at what's going on. Whereas you know, my living was made, the first part of my life was was made, you know, reading very long news stories about what was going on in politics. And Kirk, you you would do it at a, at a supper club, you know, you know, bullshitting around a table about what was happening. So we've, we've all come at it from different ways. It's just that Kristen's is the only one that's made anybody laugh lately. So for that, we... <laughs> well, let's turn our attention to the news because there's, there's good news and there's bad news on the pandemic front. The good news, well over 10% of the Wisconsin population is now fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and uh, the coronavirus case numbers continue to fall to levels that we haven't seen since June of last year. I've got a, a spreadsheet that tracks the Department of Health Services numbers every single day. And I, I have to tell you to, to, to see that trend line going back down uh, does my heart a lot of good. So that's the good news. The bad news is that some of the same people who allowed the pandemic to get as bad as it got are still in positions where they could blow a lot of the progress that we've been making lately. Critics of mask requirements and other safeguards continue to challenge them or undermine them. Even as Governor Tony Eber said recently that he will issue a new mask requirement when the current one expires because we are not out of the woods yet. At least that's what the governor says, Kirk. So I'm asking you first, is it time to rip our face masks off dramatically like <laughs> Trump did on the White House balcony? Is it time to burn our masks like they did over the weekend in Idaho, maybe to keep warm? or maybe things aren't entirely safe right now what's it looking like by you well i mean i mean it's it's still i mean you know the northwoods it's we've been anti-mask uh since day one up here um i was delivering beer down in madison uh yesterday and uh and you know i was getting I, I was talking to some buddies who were like 60 you know over 60 and they got their they got their vaccinations and they were just overjoyed. It's like they were, they couldn't wait. The excitement was palpable about them being able to go out and see their friends and everything. But, but unfortunately up here, it's a, it's a different story. People haven't seen their friends, you know, for the whole thing. I mean, obviously some people, it's like a half and half, half of us have, have really, uh, you know, sheltered down and a lot, probably about a, another half is just kind of going about their business, not really caring about the mask. So it's always been a little dodgy up here, I have to say. Kristen, you're probably in a spot where it, they give you a funny look if you don't have a mask. Oh yeah, I think I saw I, I saw a funny meme the other day that was like, oh, I was terrified because I, I forgot my mask and I thought someone was going to think think I was a Republican. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think at least in Milwaukee, there's still you know it's 25% capacity. I think at bars and restaurants, everyone has to be seated. You have to be wearing a mask. Um, but that said. I, I've definitely since moving to Milwaukee have gone out and participated and, and I think been trying to support small businesses that are trying to stay open, but because they're following all the rules, I feel safe there. But I do think, I think it's, it's hard because even I, who I've always been, you know, believe the science and I always wear my mask, like the fatigue of this is, and like, I think seeing numbers go down, seeing people get vaccinated and like, getting this hope that like 
oh, hopefully we're almost there that we can actually start living normal life again. Because for me, I mean, I don't know about anyone else. Like the number, my eyes just might, granted when my, when I, I'm not a numbers person in the first place. So my eyes always kind of gloss over with numbers, but especially now looking at them and I don't, it just means nothing to me anymore. And it's just, just like hoping that we're hoping that we're almost there. I think that's the the toughest part that's going to stick with me for forever is how numb people have become to these numbers. I mean, remember the first couple of cases were scary and the first couple of deaths were scary. And then it was, we've had as many deaths as on 9-11. Well, that was still some 500,000 or more deaths ago. And, you know, the, the, the lack of um, discipline by some, by patience, of, of compassion, uh, that part's always going to stick with me. But the other part that that does is, is the people who did honestly try to look out for one another. And even, even after getting vaccinated, you can still carry the virus, perhaps. You can still transmit it, perhaps. And so, you know, having that mask is, is a good thing until we know that more people have received uh, that vaccination. And not only are people still having health concerns, people are still having economic concerns. I mean, that part is, is very real. And, and that takes us to, you know, the, the pandemic relief bill that uh, passed through Congress this week and, and President Biden is going to sign. And, you know, Kristen, you can tell us about some of the things that uh, affect Wisconsin about it in, in a sec here. But I, I want to set it up by saying that, you know, the, the relief plan passed, but not before. Ron Johnson, Wisconsin's own version of Fredo Corleone devised a clever scheme to <laughs> call the final vote, hoping that in the 11 hours that it took those poor clerks to read the bill, as he forced them to do, that somehow this bill would go from 70% public support and majority Republican support and somehow become unpopular in that 11 hours. It, it didn't happen. And so the bill did pass. And uh, th this was my favorite part. There was supposed to be 20 hours of debate after that. That was the Senate rule. Well, the reading finishes. Johnson and the other Republican senators are nowhere to be found on the Senate floor. Democratic senators put up a motion to cut the amount of debate time from 20 hours down to three. No Republicans are there to object. So Johnson's stunt actually shortened the time that it took until there was a vote on the bill. Well played, Senator. Well played. <laughs> Kristen, you've, you've been looking at what uh, kinds of things might uh, we see I mean, we, we know all the big numbers, but they have real impact in Wisconsin and, and across the country. Yeah, I mean, I think the one that stands out to me the most is just what's gonna happen with the child tax credit and what a big impact that will have on, I mean, I think the, the estimated number in Wisconsin is it's gonna bring 46,000 children above the poverty line, which is a significant number. And I think what's interesting about it is um, the potential of opening the door where this, while in this bill, that will only last a year, uh, the potential of that staying, that that will just be the same thing that we all just assume social security is a standard thing, uh, that the potentially having, you know, children not be in poverty is something that will become a standard, which I think is a good thing because there's a lot of evidence out there that even short terms, like short sprints of being in poverty as a child has like long-term traumatic effects on your trajectory. And so that's the thing that I'm the most excited about, but you know, otherwise it's a lot of money. It's, uh, I, where's the, and now I'm looking at it, but, um, it's a lot of money to, to put into the economy and but it's also a lot of money Kristen that that happens to be about the same amount of money that got <laughs> passed a couple of years ago in that big tax giveaway right you know right after Trump took office and you know that too was around a two trillion dollar price tag which you know, suddenly the the deficit hawks were nowhere to be found now they've come back like the swallows to Capistrano or the buzzards to Hinkley or the <laughs> suddenly it's all about the deficit and the, and the wish list that amount of money would not have been required if over the years we had done things like help make sure kids didn't slide into poverty, make sure our schools actually were, were working, make sure unemployment benefits were, you know, healthy enough to bridge people till they got the next job, um, you know, take care of vaccine distribution and PPE supplies, all of these things that, that weren't done, that were neglected until now. Shouldn't be a big surprise, Kirk, that uh, some of these needs are finally being met because 
what did we always hear four years ago? Elections have consequences. Yeah, and you know, like what I what I hate to what I hear is that you know this is all nine percent of this thing is going towards COVID and all of uh, uh, the rest oh. of it is pork. I mean, where are people? Get, this is the crazy part. Like, where are people getting this information? Because it's completely false. But the other stuff is is part and parcel of the economic disaster that COVID caused. Yeah. So, like, like, like what you said, Kristen. I loved in my in my campaign. I went to a childcare facility in Eagle River, and they were they were suffering, and they needed they needed uh, federal funding desperately because they because people weren't sending their kids to child care facilities. So they were they were closing all over the place. Uh, daycare centers were closing. And so how are they going to stay, stay afloat without some assistance? And there's a shortage of daycare centers in a non COVID world all throughout northern Wisconsin. So like these things had that had to happen. You, you got to keep restaurants still floating like so many have closed. You know, my brew pub have my brew pub had to close in September because there wasn't enough aid. But now there is and some won't shutter shutter their doors. It's not COVID relief. It's economic relief. And that's uh, that's what we have to have right now. What was especially telling uh, on the on the afternoon that it passed on Wednesday afternoon was that American Airlines sent letters to 13,000 workers that had gotten a layoff notice sometime earlier saying the American Rescue Plan has passed. You can tear up those layoff notices because of the, the aid that's going to be in there. It protected that many jobs. So while one side of the aisle was protecting 13,000 jobs in a single company along with everything else, the other side of the aisle was worried about Dr. Seuss books with racially incentive imagery. Again, stay strong, guys. Yeah. If anyone actually wanted to pay us about yapping about all things Wisconsin, this is where you'd hear a commercial. But as it is, the three of us have our own individual endeavors to talk about. So consider this the fine print of the program. Kirk <laughs> Bankstead is owner of the Monaco Brewing Company. One of its brews is called Fair Maps. Why call a beer Fair Maps? Because 5% of all the profits get spent or donated to causes designed to end gerrymandering in Wisconsin. Because Monaco Brewing Company believes voters should select their representatives, not the other way around. Look up Monaco Brewing Company on Facebook, where you can learn to get a batch. Kristen Bry can regularly be seen on As Goes Wisconsin, a fixture on all your favorite social media feeds. You come for the TikToks, you stay for the accidental education about Wisconsin history, the latest news, and what she has talked your mom into doing on video this time. And I'm Pat Kreitlow, the managing editor of Up North News, a digital newsroom covering Wisconsin online at upnorthnewswi.com or look for Up North News WI on your favorite social media site. The Up North podcast is not affiliated with Up North News, but if our little show here happens to get you to support any of our daytime jobs, well, wasn't that time well spent for all of us. Uh, let's, let's take a pause right here. Thanks for being with us. You're Up North. And welcome back to Up North. I'm Pat Kreitlow along with Kirk Bankstead and Kristen Bry. Two weeks ago, uh, the Department of Natural Resources had to rush to cobble together a wolf hunt as ordered by a court after the Trump administration in one of its final actions removed the wolf from federal protection. The resulting confusion led to nearly double the number of wolves killed as called for by wildlife experts, some by gunfire, some by trapping, some chased down by packs of dogs. That a hunting season is needed to manage the population size is acknowledged by many, but a hunting season that's poorly managed does no one any favors. And at Up North News, we had a story about that, about how the Ojibwa were very upset not being consulted. They at least claimed half of the allotment that you know stayed alive, but they want the hunt to be better managed. Kirk, what are people saying up north about this and, and what the future looks like for wolf hunting up north? Well, this is, I mean, this is a huge issue up north and you know hunting in general is huge up north and but tom tiffany when he was a state leg state senator and now he's the congressman i mean this is like i think this occupies about 99 percent of his brain um and being a traitor maybe is the other one percent but like like it's a huge thing that, that we have to have this wolf hunt and i'm all for it, it is it we, I mean, when I was running, I, I had to like learn about this issue. I wasn't really even sure what it was before I ran for office. But uh, yeah, we're 
we have enough gray wolf in Wisconsin right now to be able to hunt some of them. They're not endangered anymore. But um, what they did in this hunt, because um, you know there was a Kansas hunting group that took Wisconsin to court and some judge in Jefferson County said, okay, you have to get this hunt going right now. So they did it wrong. Um, I just say, follow the science. You know, if the DNR, they know what they're doing, just let them create the rules. Don't like force a hunt down their throats. Uh, so the Northwoods, should, we should hunt. This is what we do up here, but we did it all wrong this time. Working on this as a, as a legislator uh, once upon a time, uh, again, it, it's about not whether there should be a hunt. You want a population managed, but you want it done right. You want it done well. And the same can be said for uh, using dogs in, in hunting. Wisconsin has one of, if not the most uh, generous uh, reimbursement rates if uh, hunting dogs are killed. And there's a lot of concern that that becomes an incentive then to not have the best trained dogs out there. Uh, and instead they, they almost are, are sent to slaughter is the fear that some have. And so it really does speak to having a, a, a much better managed program, but you can't do that so long as you know some folks in elected office treat the DNR as, as some kind of an enemy rather than as an advocate that can keep the entire you know, North Woods uh, with a healthy ecosystem. Let's turn to uh, some lighter uh, topics, although it's not that light. A milk stout itself is, is not a light, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. So Kirk and the Monaco Brewing Company crew has been feverishly uh, packaging or delivering their latest brand. It's called a milk stout with Wisconsin and Vermont maple syrup. So if there's Vermont maple syrup in there, it can only have one name attached to it, Kirk. And uh, tell us <laughs> about this Bernie brew. Living up in Monaco, you know, there's a heck of a lot more people who voted for Bernie than voted for more centrist uh, Democrats uh, in the in both the presidential primary and even you know five years ago when when Hillary and Bernie were running. So uh, up here, Bernie's Bernie's a god if you're a progressive. So um, even though we came out with the uh, Biden beer and Kamala beer first, uh, I'm really proud of this one because we call it, this is, this, we call it a lovingly irascible and democratic socialist milk stout. Uh, what, what I love about making beer that's progressive beer is that 5% of all our profits, you know, some of it's going to fair maps and gerrymandering, but it's all going to uh, uh, progressive politics through the Monaco Brewing Company Super PAC which we've put signs up when Ron Johnson does crazy things. Um, we, we put radio ads up when Rob Swearingen votes to get ma like to overturn a mask mandate. Um, you know, and we're, we're, we're actively trying to change kind of uh, the political scene around here. And our word of the day is irascible. Uh, so there will be a spelling test after that. We, we've talked about, you know, Kristen's take on politics doing, you know, short comedic videos, but Kirk, from a corporate standpoint, this is the first time some people are hearing that Monaco Brewing Company has a super PAC. And that's all about Citizens United and, and the world we live in now, isn't it? There's been so much money that has flooded Wisconsin, dark money, I call it, uh, you know, from the Koch brothers and all these like super PACs, um, that it's really changed the landscape of our state. I mean, look at our Supreme Court, for example. You get millions of dollars in a, that f floods in, in from Republicans for a nonpartisan election, like a judge, you know, and, and it's really shaped our, you know, our Supreme Court, it's shaped our, our Congress, our, our, our legislature. And so I was like, man, if the Koch brothers can do it, why can't the Monaco Brewing Company, <laughs> you know? And so we've raised about 130,000 bucks in about a month and a half um, from people who agree uh, that, that, you know, we need to change politics up north where we've kind of been in the wilderness because the democratic party is really focused on changing things in madison milwaukee but but they've kind of left us in the lurch up here so people are believing in it and and i i, I call it dark money meant for good hey christian's <laughs> going to tell us next about uh women's history month uh being marked in, in wisconsin and elsewhere but before Kristen takes us to school we should point out first uh, a little something about the Equal Rights Amendment. And if you're under the age of 50, you've probably never heard of it and never heard that you know the ERA is not just a baseball uh, term, but also stands for this attempt to amend the, the US Constitution. It was actually in the news last week, and now there's going to be a, an attempt at a new state ERA here in Wisconsin. We reported at Up North News, that's upnorthnewswi.com, that some legislators uh, are introducing this new Equal Rights Amendment 
that's not only meant to enshrine in the state constitution that women deserve to be free from discrimination, but the same applies to gender identity, sexual preference, religious preference, race, color, national origin, marital or family status, age, and, and other characteristics. The original ERA was sent off for ratification in 1972. Wisconsin was one of the first states to ratify it, but after conservative activists got busy, it failed to get approval by three fourths of the state within seven years as required. There was a lawsuit challenging that seven year limit so that more states could try to ratify it, but a federal judge about a week ago upheld the limit and said the original ERA is dead. And so here we are with a new proposal at the state level being introduced during Women's History Month. So Kristen, back in that early 1970s, a, a woman named Vel Phillips was making Wisconsin history and apparently might do so again uh, after her life has passed uh, by, by being um, memorialized right on the grounds of the state capitol. So why, why is Belle Phillips uh, one of those Wisconsin women we, we should really get to know more about? Yeah, I didn't know anything about her up until last month. I actually ended up doing a whole series on Ask Us Wisconsin of Wisconsin Black history that I never learned. Uh, and I didn't even get to cover, I think I scratched the surface as far as the different topics that one got suggested to me through comments on any of my videos, but also just the rabbit hole I went down. Um, so I'm gonna keep that series going, uh, even though it's not Black History Month anymore, but I never knew anything about Bella R. Phillips and the, she's one kick-ass lady. And so I'm gonna try to remember for by memory, um, all the things that she was, so she was the first black woman to graduate from UW Law School. She was the first black woman or first also woman and black. There's a bunch of, she was either the first woman, the first black woman or the first black person to do all of these different things. And I, UW Madison Law School, it was getting elected to um, the Common Council in Milwaukee, which is an interesting story because people saw her name on the ballot and thought she was a white man. And that's how, like the theory of how she got elected. Uh, she was the first, uh, she was uh, Sec Secretary of State. And, Secretary and, of State. And, and uh, she was the, the, the pleasure of her, uh, not long before her passing, I, when I was running for Congress in 2012, and they have you make a million phone calls to people either for donations or endorsements. And at the time, I, you know, they just give you these sheets. There's names and there's, you know, what they've given and a little bit of history. Well, under Bell Phillips, there was a lot of history. And that was one of those conversations where your camp people are, are your campaign people are going wrap it up. We got we got to call more people. I'm like, no, do you know who this is? And yeah. we just had, we had the <laughs> best conversation. And I, I wish I would have uh, been able to meet her in person. But you know, she's one of so many trailblazing women that we've had in the state. I, you know, Gwen Moore, Ada Deer, Tammy Baldwin, Shirley Abramson. Um, you know, there's just a host of them, Kirk. And I, and I know you know from the past and the present, we we have, we have no shortage of of women who have been, you know, showing leadership where, where others would not. Yeah, I have one and she is special to Manaqua, Wisconsin. And her name is Dr. Kate Pelham Newcomb. And she was referred to as the angel on snowshoes because she would actually strap on snowshoes and do house calls for sick people when there was too much snow to like, to, to drive cars on. And uh, so she was just like a tough lady and she's 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 known for this million penny march where she and like the school like middle school kids like like started raising pennies to build a hospital in Woodruff which is right next to Manaqua and somehow they got on a show in the 1950s like a na nationwide show about this story and people started sending pennies from all over the country and all over the world um this is what I read uh, all over the world. I'm not sure how they had pennies, but they still sent pennies. And, uh, and so they were able to get this hospital. And, and so there's a, there's a museum in Minocqua named after Dr. Kate. And uh, so she is my uh, uh, female of Wisconsin uh, to commemorate uh, from the Northwoods during, uh, during uh, this, this equal rights you know, kind of conversation. It was such a great story to read because my, my wife occasionally works at the Monaco Hospital. And one time I was, you know, waiting in the lobby and, you know, there were plaques in there about that, about uh, the appearance on, uh, I want to say it was, it was either This Is Your Life or, or again, one yeah. of the famous shows at the time. And uh, yeah, people all over the country just sending in pennies back when a community would have to raise that kind of money to have a hospital there. 
Um, yep. and, and all thanks to a, a woman who was willing to go see people, you know, when others didn't. So yeah, we, we've, we've got some women in our history. Got some ladies, got some uh, kick-ass some ladies. ladies. All right, let's look ahead uh, as we kind of wrap up our shows each week. We'll see what kinds of things are, are coming up. Obviously, baseball season is coming up before much longer. That's great. But another thing that's coming up this weekend, daylight saving time. And that's where we offer this modest proposal that when we spring the clocks ahead, screw them down in place and never let them go back again. There is no reason to go back to standard time. It's better to have things an hour ahead at this northern latitude. Unless you use a sundial, you don't really care that the sun is here at noon, you know, rather than here, you know, or here, depending on where your north or south is. Leave daylight savings time in place. Or, you know, you two can fight me on it. Well, I think, I mean, I've because we talked about, you know, we're, we're thinking about this as part of the show. I looked it up and it, there actually are studies that show that like you need a little more daylight in, like after like the school hours for kids and, you right. know, and for adults for mental health. Like it actually is a thing that if you, you know, if you have more daylight kind of at the end of the day than in the morning, then it's actually better for you, for your, for your mental health. And that's so, actually where I got the, uh, the, the rant on this was from a, a pediatrician friend of mine talking about, you know, the benefit that would come to kids if you had more light, you know, after school was done, uh, whether it's getting homework done or being able to actually play, have a yeah. life. Yeah. Look how bad we turned out because as soon as that's we got home from point, school, sir, it was like school. dark as hell. You know, I started, I started like turning vampires before dinner even happened. I mean, yeah, I think we need to help the children because look at us. <laughs> well, with that, we are going to wrap up this week's discussion for the Up North podcast. And we're glad you were a part of this initial broadcast. And so Kristen Bryan, Kirk Bankstead, I'm Pat Kreitlow. Enjoy your week. Let me die.